Texas has not achieved its goal this year, and that's a bummer. But it is year one, and building a roster only really starts after that first season when coaches know exactly what they're working with. How can we develop our current players? Which recruits can be instant difference makers next year? And how will the transfer portal benefit us postseason? Joe Cook over at Inside Texas is here to help answer the question, where do the Texas Longhorns go from here? Make sure to sign up at Inside Texas for constant Texas Longhorn updates and articles. Take your fandom to the next level and sign up today on InsideTexas.com. And as always, don't forget to pick up your new hat for the new season at Last Stand Hats. Use promo code TexasHomer, all caps, for 10% off your purchase at LastStandHats.com. Development of current players, 2022 recruits, and the transfer portal will all be crucial in Sark assembling a team of his own. Well, we see a very different roster in the next year. Without further ado, let's get into it. What's up, Joe? Glad you're back on. And I always like to hear your reasoning on things, so let's get it started immediately. So first, let's talk about in-season solutions to better the team. Two weeks of really disappointing end results, and the bye week allows some time to hit the reset button. So what's been the focus of the coaches and the players during the bye week? So he focused in on on Monday, kind of surprising that he even had a Monday press conference in the first place because that's not something Texas coaches seems to do. So he he showed up, spoke a little bit about just how they're trying to, you know, focus in on the team and make sure that, hey, you lost two straight leads in the fourth quarter in pretty rough fashion. Well, we got more games left. You know, you're going to have to recover. You're going to have to get better from that. So focusing on that, trying to re-encourage the team and, and let them know that you've got games ahead of you, you've got a task to do ahead of you. Uh, let's work this practice week on what we know we need to work on and then start getting into Baylor in the coming week uh, to, to try and get ready for the rest of the Big 12 slate. And then on the physical side of things, are coaches moving players around in practice, trying to find that perfect combination on both sides? So we saw even during the game that they're going to try and make some solution for that offensive line. Uh, you heard Steve Sarkeesian mention about how Tope Amade making his first career start as a six-year senior, they weren't going to throw him totally to the wolves and make him go out there the whole game. So they put a true freshman there to spell him for a little bit in Hayden Connor for, to get a few series and to give Tope some time to fully acclimate to a game he's been in for, for six years. But you're also seeing the mix and match at, at other positions. You saw uh, Andre Karich go in and play at left tackle when Christian Jones needed a pull. And then they put Christian Jones back in the game later. Uh, When Jake Majors missed a series or two or a few plays or so, uh, they put Derek Kerstetter in, slid Christian Jones over to left tackle and put Andre Karich to right tackle. So um, as you can even just see during the game that they're trying to do something, at least along the offensive line, Uh, even at tight end, you've seen uh, Juan Davis, Gunnar Helm, Cade Brewer, uh, even even Jared Wiley, all those guys cycle in. Uh, it seems like the, the decision for mixing and matching, I guess, must be up to the position position coach because you're seeing it those positions. You're only seeing it in limited amounts at wide receiver and running back and, and even quarterback. But that's something that falls along the head coach's purview. Yeah, man, we're in that weird spot where the best thing you can do truly for an offensive line is give them continuity. But we don't have that luxury due to performance issues and an injury at left guard. So if they don't sub, people wonder why. And when they do sub, people wonder why. It's a damned if you do, damned if you don't thing. And also, man, this is not truly knowable, but I just kind of want your take on it. Are we likely to see significant improvement this season? I mean, that's the hope. You have to remember, this is Steve Sarkeesian's first year. So, of course, they want to win as many games as possible. And the best way to build a program is to win as many games as possible. And maybe this doesn't line up with some impatient fans. And I completely understand their lack of patience considering the past decade plus. But you're also building your program. And at some point, Hayden Connor is going to be here and Tope Amada isn't. At some point, you're just going to have to try and find the right combination. So there, you can see there's little bits of uh, building the program, trying to be couched in among winning games immediately. That's kind of what I see. But Still, at the same time, if you're trying to win the most games, you want to get a unit that has continuity. Granted, Denza Okafor going down presented a challenge they probably weren't expecting, and they're trying to figure out who that next person is. You know, when you have your top five, you also hopefully have a number six, a number seven, and a number eight. Well, at this point, number number six and seven, Tope Amade and Andre Karich are the guys getting playing time, and, and now uh, Hayden Connor is too. 
So at this point, you're kind of mixing and matching among that top group. They're not rotating anybody in at this point who's outside of that group, outside of that trust tree. But still, that, that, that top group of offensive linemen, as we've seen play out throughout the course of the year, there's some guys who they, they just simply cannot fully trust. So it, it's a tough situation for, for Kyle Flood and, and Steve Sarkeesian to be in. They're, they're trying, at least it seems like, but sometimes the, the pieces they have just don't make everything go as, with, as well as they want it to go. The coaches are between a rock and a hard place, so they're just doing what they can to get us through season one. And then also as far as hard development, skill acquisition, how are the coaches building up the current kids to perform like their players did in previous stops? So one thing that the the offense and defense on the whole, not just on a position level, is, is to find an identity. And I think against Oklahoma State, the defense wasn't helped by the offense by any stretch of the imagination. But you saw that true 3-4 look that had Moro Jomo and then a nose tackle, usually Keandre Coburn, and then Alfred Collins playing in a three-down front. And – as you saw me focus in on Alfred Collins, those are some guys who can figure out that role and play in them well. So what they may be doing is figuring out that, hey, this three down front that we have and our you know, pretty good experienced edge guys, not great by any stretch, not elite by any stretch of the imagination, but pretty good in Ovia Gofu, Ray Thornton, and Ben Davis. Those are guys that can cause some havoc, at least when playing against some of the run teams against in the big 12, like even Baylor projects to be. So it seems like what Bo Davis has tried to do is find that that three down front and Pete Kwiatkowski too, find that that three down front is how they get their best personnel on the field and deployed in the proper ways. Because if you watch Alfred Collins, that's a guy who opposing teams, there are a few offensive linemen that have the strength to match his strength. So if you put him and have to dedicate two guys to him, that's going to open things up for a gofu for Davis, for Thornton. So I think that's where they may have found something, at least on the defensive front. It's a tougher question on the offensive line. I think we've all kind of talked about how wide zone and outside zone is is the way to go for this team. And on Bijan Robinson's touchdown run, you saw just perfect blocking. I, I mentioned that's if you look up outside zone in about 30 to 40 years, you're going to see a picture of that play concerning the lane that Bijan Robinson had to run through. But eventually people are going to realize that this team is a running team. It's somewhat limited by quarterback, no matter who's back there, no matter how many ones are on the uniform, it's limited by quarterback and they're going to stack the box just like Oklahoma state did and say, you know what? Bijan Robinson's good, but he's not better than the numbers we're going to dedicate. So if, if Oklahoma or if Texas can figure out a way to keep blocking and start to mix in the downfield shots, that's going to help. Uh, that's going to help whatever Kyle Flood wants to do going forward, not just this year, but in years to come. Yeah, man, there's a year one ceiling that we are hitting apparently almost across the board. So let's turn to recruiting to see if we can solve any of these problems in the upcoming class. And recruiting evaluators often remind us that the recruits aren't as reactionary as fans are due to them being in the industry and kind of understanding the game a little bit more. But how do any additional losses affect our chances to pull the top, top guys? Well, while you know, they don't look at the binary of the results. The results still play a factor. No, no kid wants to go to a losing program. No fan wants to root for a losing program. That's for sure. But they can also see what's going on on the field and how those losses are, are being accumulated. And, and the thing is, for the past what, four or five years, Texas, I think it's played in, in 30 one possession games. So it's not like they're getting just trounced left and right. So I guess from a per- recruiting pers- perspective, there are kids who are like, look, if I go there, maybe I'm that missing piece or stuff like that. And that, that works for some kids. And then at the same time, joining an already humming machine is more appealing to them, too. So it's on the coaches to, to find that right pitch and to sell it to them. Uh, but the close losses, they, they, they hurt for fans. They hurt for players. They hurt for coaches. But they're not as debilitating to the recruiting efforts as I think the same fans would want to think whenever they see, oh, no, everything's lost because we lost this game. Uh, they can see that, you know, there's there's, you know, this play, this margin right there that's just just missing to where, you know, the result could go another way. Now, that's a little bit easier with the skill positions because, I mean, and Xavier Worthy is a prime example of this. It's a lot easier to come in and play at a skill position than probably along 
the offensive line. So if you have, say, any of the you know star tackles or offensive linemen that Texas is in on, you know, yeah, you want to have those guys, but it's hard to play in the trenches, no matter what conference you're in, no matter what team you're facing. It's hard to play in the trenches in year one as an offensive lineman. So I, I think what you see is the skilled players understand that they may have a little bit more uh, leeway to come in and, and make an immediate impact. I'm sure the offensive linemen believe the same. Uh, it's a little less practical, but if it becomes more practical, and I think uh, looking back in recent history, Zach Shackelford's a great example of this. If you have a guy come in and, and start playing right away, that's indicative of a lot more problem problems with your program than just, you know, missing a play or two. For sure. And we hear all the time, like all Texas needs to do is land some offensive linemen. And that's true, but it's still a delayed effect of two to three years in most cases. And in our specific situation, I do believe guys will play earlier out of necessity. But looking at the current roster, which position groups are the highest priority for the staff? Well, I think there has to be some influx of talent at wide receiver and on the offensive line, at least for these next couple of years, even whenever B. John Robinson leaves after next year, which I think we can all make make a pretty safe bet that's going to be the case and nobody will bat an eye. Uh, running back is still <clears throat> in a pretty good situation between Keelan Robinson, Jonathan Brooks, and then the two committed in the class right now. Wide receiver, I think you're, you need more difference makers. I think Xavier Worthy is one. Jordan Whittington is probably another, but he can't stay on the field. So they need to find somebody at wide receiver who can accompany Xavier Worthy and be a playmaker that – so where opponents can't focus their entire secondary on one guy. And then obviously defense or offensive line uh, with, with, with Sam Cosme leaving uh, with some other experienced guys who are playing now, not being anything exactly what I think a lot of fans wanted them to be. It's pretty apparent that there's opportunity available on that offensive line. And that's a place that, especially for a running offense like Steve Sarkeesian's to, to work properly they need that running game to work and they need some guys who can make it work. And some of those guys just don't appear to be on the roster right now. I am happy the staff is identifying needs correctly and going after the big fish and what spots on the roster are solid at the moment, but they're going to be super thin after the NFL draft or graduation and defensive backs immediately come to mind for me. Yeah, I I think defensive back, especially with Deshaun Jameson, Josh Thompson, uh, Anthony Cook, B.J. Foster, Brennan Schooler, no matter what you think of their on-field play, their eligibility clock is about to expire. So, you know, even with the COVID year, no matter what they decide, those aren't positions that you have a long-term outlook at right now. So defensive back, I think, is definitely a place that they, they need to make sure that their development is working properly. And I think they're in decent shape. I think Chad A. Barron and even uh, Keaton Crawford have shown ability to make sure that at least at corner, they'll be in decent shape. But safety is a place of concern for sure. Um, Linebacker, you're probably going to lose to Marvin Overshone after this year, which is why guys like Jalen Ford, uh, David Benda, I guess even Devin Richardson, their development is paramount too. It doesn't seem like that issue is there on the defensive line because while the, the edge players right now are some of the more experienced guys, remember they attacked the edge position in the 2021 class. And so they're hoping that some of those guys are able to, you know, rise up through the ranks as spring of 22 to spring of 22 goes on. And we've even seen some flashes from guys like Baron Sorrell uh, make some moves early. So I think you're on the money with, with the secondary being a place where they've got to make sure that the guys waiting in the wings are ready whenever their time is called next year. And we've seen some glimpses, especially from Jade Baron, uh, but we, you know, it takes more than glimpses to create a solid product. I'm ready for the younger guys to, you know, finally evolve into those starter roles. And I wanted to do a quick recap of the important recruits Texas is after. If you want longer explanations or to see their game tape, look on my page. You'll find three or four videos covering each recruit in depth. But as far as a refresher or for people new to the recruiting side, who are the big names Texas wants to land for 2022? So, of course, you've got on three's number four prospect in in Evan Stewart in the 2022 class, Uh, former Texas commit, a guy that Andre Coleman has remained on and who recently made his way to Austin to see the game. That's going to be one of their, if not their top priority at wide receiver. I think along the offensive line, uh, you've got guys like 
uh, Cam Dewberry, Kelvin Banks. Those are going to be the people that uh, Kyle Flood focus on, despite wherever their commitments may be. Uh, and then in the secondary, of course, they have Champ Lewis committed, but the, the prize is definitely Denver Harris, uh, especially a cornerback. And that's somebody uh, they're going to be focused in on. And then at safety, you know, considering we're talking about Schooler, Foster, all those guys probably taking their chances and moving on after this year, uh, it, it, whether they have eligibility or not, Jacoby Matthews becomes even more important at that safety position. So those are just a, a few of the names available. Uh, there's definitely more that we're always in discussion of on Inside Texas, but uh, those are the stars, uh, the five stars even, that uh, Texas would, would love to see on the roster next year. Also, top offensive guard Devon Campbell is a major target as well uh, to round up the list. We're kind of going against Oklahoma there currently. So we covered current team solutions and recruiting solutions. So now let's talk offseason changes that could help as well. First things first, do you think Sark hits the portal hard this offseason? Yeah, I, I think that that's the way that Texas knows it needs to be able to build a program. And luckily for Steve Sarkeesian, there's some examples literally down the hall for him to look at. Going to softball, which maybe people look at, maybe people don't. But Mike White has built a championship level roster by recruiting out of the portal a lot of players from Oregon, his, his previous stop. Uh, David Pierce picked up Mike Antico last year ahead of a uh, national semifinals run. Picked up Devin Messenger this year from Kansas, who could be the starting third baseman. And then you have to look at Chris Beard. This whole roster and, and most of the starting five is composed of transfers picked up in the portal. So unless you're Dabo Sweeney and we're seeing how that strategy of no portal is, is working this year, I think most coaches realize that the portal is a way that they have to recruit to. Uh, Texas has strong academic programs, has is going to have an opportunity for playing time. They wouldn't be record, recruiting out of the portal if that wasn't there. And they, they honestly just need it. They're, they're, there's glaring needs on the roster that need infusions of talent with playing time available. And I think you, Steve Sarkeesian is savvy enough to know that that's where they have to look. I mean, just look at last year when edge rushers, as a result of several years of recruiting to a three down front, there weren't any on the roster. And especially after Joseph Osai left. So that was a position that they just desperately needed people. Uh, they did attack it in the high school ranks with guys like David Abiara uh, and Baron Sorrell. But at the same time, they needed to get those guys like Ovia Gofu, Ben Davis, Ray Thornton in order to alleviate pressure at that position to have it. So it seems like there's an understanding. They know they have to hit the portal. And I'd be surprised if they weren't looking in the portal, not just at, at defensive line, but basically across any position looking for best available players. Yeah. And you also have the main rival down the road in Lincoln Riley, who's having great success with transfers and making that a core talent acquisition strategy for them and almost forces Sark to play the game as well. And now that Sark and the coaches are able to truly fully understand what players they have, how much roster turnover do you expect come off season? We'll see. Uh, that's, that's a great question. It's hard to put an exact figure on there. Um, I think as if you didn't know this, I think uh, recruit or scholarships for football, they're renewable year over year. So you have to earn your way on there. Uh, it's very, very rare, I think, for, for coaches just to straight up say get lost. Uh, but you, sometimes the writing on the wall is, is spray painted for you to be able to see. So uh, I think Steve Sarkeesian's aware that Texas needs an infusion of talent. There's only 85 scholarships, and that's even with these COVID alleviations uh, with, with, with as far as eligibility goes. Uh, but, you know, I, I think you're going to see uh, Steve Sarkeesian trying to recreate the roster in his vision and doing it by the means available, and the means available are the porter, portal. And you've covered the sport longer than I have. So is it common to see coaches turn over the roster after year one? Coaches don't always say like, hey, man, you got to go, but they can surely make life uncomfortable for players as a hint. So is it normal to see a lot of outgoing transfers after year one just in general? Yes and no. Uh, some I think Steve Sarkeesian's a little bit less brutish, I guess, in that regard. I think especially looking at uh, the way past head coaches have operated at Texas. Um, but I, and, and there are some times when I push back against the, the R guys type of thing. Yes, you want to look for guys who fit what you're looking for, but those guys may still exist on the roster and just haven't been able to do it what you are looking for in that system. Um, 
still, you know, when when you're looking at Texas and where the the positions that we talk about as consistent weaknesses are, I think that's where you're going to find where they're going to attack and look for some more guys to add to the roster and, and bring in that influx of talent. It can be a harsh reality. The guys in the two deep are generally safe, but any cultural stragglers can end up getting cut. It's simple math. You run off the third that isn't performing or isn't buying in, and you automatically have less people now to convince. You can fill those spots with people that are committed specifically to Sark's vision. And that's why every every coach always, at least at this point, they know that unless the kid just sucks, and then, you know, there's a handful every year, right. not to name names, and I'm not going to name names, <laughs> right. but there are a handful of kids who just suck every year. Outside of that handful, it's kind of evident there's no point in burning bridges. I mean, look at SMU. They've built off of transfers who like coming back home to the DFW area. Dana Holgerson's done the same thing at U of H, although at a little bit slower process. I'm sure Tulane, even UTSA, and I guess even TCU in that regard, they've they've said, you know, hey, you know, we may have missed you the first time. We're ready for you a second time. There's no point in burning bridges. I think that's a little bit of evidence of how some of the kids have power these days. It's a balance, of course. It's not all in the kids' hands. It's not all in the coaches' hands. It's a balance, but that's definitely a place where the kids have power to where, you know, if they if somebody gets in the portal – they're going to remember the coach that said, oh, you committed to another place? Well, get on out of here. Boom, you're eliminated, which is why I think most coaches are savvy enough to recognize to where you say, thank you for giving us our, your time. Good luck at your next stop. And I'm always here to be able to be talked to if something ever happens. So I'm telling you, man, ended up number two isn't so bad in the current climate because if their number one choice makes a mistake, which they almost always do, then kids are quick to head to that number two. Why do you think Xavier Worthy's at Texas? He couldn't enroll at Michigan. He really loves Steve Sarkeesian, and now he's Texas' top wide receiver. No doubt, and Sark's relationship was able to bring Keelan over from Alabama, so it's not just correct to be a nice person. It can actually be helpful. And, dude, thank you for coming on. I really enjoy your perspective and reasoning every time we talk, even off screen. So please let the fans know that I already don't know where to find your work. Yeah, uh, find me on Twitter at JosephCook89. Of course, all my stuff is on InsideTexas.com. We're at Inside Texas on Twitter, part of the On3 network, and uh, uh, all of our stuff with Justin, Eric, Ian, Scipio Tex, Bobby Burton, Jerry Hamilton. You can find it all there, and it's well worth your time and money if you're a Texas Longhorns fan. Y'all heard the man. Go check him out. He covers every Texas sport, so he's always dropping articles, always in the mix. And then also hop over to Inside Texas to stay up to date on all things Joe and I discussed in real time. Thanks for hanging out. Watch more of my videos here, and please like, subscribe, and share if you want to support quality Texas content. As always, welcome.